yeah, my name's Morgan Gallo. I am a comedian uh, based in Denver, Colorado. And uh, honestly, that's like my main job title. I'm really lucky to work with Dude I Don't Know Creative, which is also based here in Denver, um, and do podcast producing and some editing. And um, I just work in the stand-up comedy space, and I'm trying to do my best to help others get the content they need out there and be part of an awesome creative company. So it's fun. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Well, I, I always I always have to start with this question, and it's how did you find yourself driven to uh, you know, do stand up comedy, or have you always been interested in it and just kind of mm. dove into it? How did that start for you? That's always really interesting. Every time I tell this story, it gets more and more lame because like <laughs> the pandemic hit, and I was working at a private arts college, at private liberal arts college in St. Augustine, Florida just minding my business. I was in marketing. I thought that I was going to climb the corporate marketing ladder. I was convinced. And uh, the pandemic hit and I was working from home and I was making one of my friends laugh on FaceTime one day. And he goes, have you ever thought about doing stand-up comedy? And I was like, no. And like, but that sounds cool. And then um, I didn't really think anything of it. And then I started talking to another friend of mine that lives in L.A., and she said, oh, yeah, one of my friends just took a stand-up comedy class and they got to do a performance at the end and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, people can take comedy classes? And so I looked for one and I found a stand-up comedy class in Jacksonville, Florida, which is like the most random place ever to take a comedy class. And I signed up and over the summer of 2020, I took it. I think it was like maybe like eight weeks, maybe four weeks long, six weeks long. I don't know. And then uh, at the end you do like a little open mic and I did the open mic and I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do now. <laughs> and then I just started <laughs> doing it. It's like, I wish it was a cooler story than that, <laughs> but that's honestly just like how it happened. And then from there, I just started like meeting more comics and learning more about what it meant to be a comedian, going to open mics, listening to podcasts, reading all that type of stuff. So, yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say it's a lame story at all. It's It has layers to it, going from working at a liberal arts college in Florida yeah. to, to comedy. I mean, when you were growing up, did you always have kind of a, that I like to call it like that ham energy yeah. to make people laugh? I was a big ham. Like I, I was always like, I loved attention and I was on the dance team. And when I was dancing, like sometimes I would try to make my friends laugh, but I wasn't like, humor wasn't like my focus like I was always like a funny kid like I did silly stuff and like I always wanted to make my parents laugh I, but I think for me it was like a, tr a way to get validation like <laughs> as a lot of comedians a lot of us like we perform and we want to get laughs and it's like a, it's like a form of us getting external validation so I think in a way like I always was a performer and being a dancer for so long I loved being on stage and then I stopped dancing and I think I just kind of like fell into comedy well, wh why'd you stop dancing? It just wasn't um, fun anymore. Like, uh. there was a point that I got to where, and I think a lot of artists get to this place where, and you might have experienced this, where, like, after the collegiate level, like, when I was in college, I was on, like, a dance crew, and we, like, performed, and we toured around and did competitions, and, like, sometimes we'd get paid to appear, and, like, we did, like, a music video, we did, like, a party for someone, like... And then it gets to a point where it's like, okay, if I'm not going to be a professional, if I'm not going to like move to LA and start auditioning for like the major dance industry roles, then I don't know why I'm doing this anymore. And for me personally, I was focusing on getting my degree and I needed to stop spending as many hours dancing in order to get my degree finished. And once I did, I like, I, I taught dance for a while and I was a coach of a dance team at the college I worked at for like two years. But other than that, like, it was just kind of like I was over it. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes sense. After a while, if you don't reach the, the point you want to get to, I could definitely see that. And yeah. What I find fun, because I, I did comedy for uh, three or four years from high school into college and then stopped doing it for the acting thing. Yeah. Uh, but diving into comedy was always really interesting to see how many different, you know, varieties there are and how mm -hmm. many different people are, are conducting various uh, performances of it. So when you decided to take the stage, I mean, when did you find your groove with your comedy or your genre? I don't think I have yet. No. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay. Because uh, like a lot of people will say that to you when you're starting out. They're like, oh, it takes five years to develop your voice. And I, I believe that. And I also don't believe that because I think some comedians just know who they are right off the bat. Mm. And, th- and it's like amazing. And they're, they have their own voice and their own like uh, sense of humor. But for me, I think it's been kind of a journey going back and forth because when I first started, I felt like I was doing a lot of like dirty comedy. I was doing a lot of like shitting on men type of comedy, just like kind of what I felt at the time, right? Because when I started, I was 23, about to turn 24. I was like so tired of dealing with lame dudes in Jacksonville, Florida. <laughs> like, and I had and I had a full time job. You know what I mean? Like, my life was so different than it is now. Whereas now, I like to talk about more of like personal issues, like body positivity, or like what it's like to be like a woman and not want kids. Um, so yeah, it's kind of like I don't know. I don't think I've I don't think I've found my groove yet. Mm. Well, yeah, I guess yeah, I did forget you are what three years into it now, so you are yeah. Still a month from now is actually when I'll be three years in. So wow. yeah. Wow. Well, and with that, starting in a place like Jacksonville, Florida. Yeah. Uh, I was born in Tampa, so I, I totally get, you get it. it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> have you noticed any differences between uh, communities as far as you know the comedy scene in Jacksonville as opposed to the comedy scene in Denver? One thousand percent. One thousand and ten five million percent. <laughs> what, what what stood out um, to you? I think, and and I I am really happy to be like from Florida. Well, I'm not from there, but I, like I am happy to be a comic that started there, because I think it gave me a very thick skin in some respects. But I think the biggest thing for me was just like the respect that people have for female comics here is so much greater than down there. Um, and I don't think it's like on purpose. I don't think that there's people going around being like, oh, they like, you're not, you're a female, you suck. You know what I mean? It wasn't that. It's just that like, I could very, I could very clearly tell in some comedy spaces down there that I was a woman. Mm -hmm. Whereas here I'm just another comic and we're all just talking shit at the open mic or whatever we're doing. Um, so yeah, that was a big thing for me. And then I think also like there's obviously something to be said about the audiences because the audiences in Florida are going to be way different. You know, it's a, it's a definitely older demographic. It's more conservative. It's a lot of tourists, people who are, you know, they just spent six hours on their boat and they're coming in to drink their fucking summer shandy at some marina and they're putting on a show at the marina and you kind of just got to grin and bear it. But, um, yeah, it's a huge, it's a huge difference. But again, I'm really happy I started there because I feel like I feel like starting in that scene taught me that I had to be my own advocate. Like I had to be like if I wanted to get anywhere in Florida, I had to be the one that like emailed, sent a headshot, gave them a clip, said, Hey, these are my credits, this is what I'm doing. And I had to be the one to make connections because it was like no one's gonna do anything for you. Um so yeah, I think that was a good experience. Well, and that's a great segue into the day in the life of a, a working comic. So uh, a lot of people probably don't even know what it's like to, to be a comic yeah. and have a, a very different work week compared to the nine to five or somebody who's working remotely, that kind of thing. So if you could walk me through, let's say, just oh god, what what's your Friday like if you have a show that evening? What what does your day well, look like? I, I'll say this though, I have a very different day in the life. I feel like as a comedian than most comedians. Okay. Because most comedians do have like a nine to five or like a, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I did for a long time. Um, And then some people also do like shift work. There's a lot of comics that have like shift work or like they have a nice gig where, you know, they work like six to two and then they can go sleep and then do it. But for me, I'm at the place I'm in with my career right now. um, A normal day is like probably getting up around like eight or nine and then coming to this studio, dude, I don't know, studios in Denver, um, and working on some editing, whether it's editing my podcast or one of the podcasts that we produce here, or doing admin work for the studio or for myself, meaning like 
are all of my shows up to date on my website? Have I sent out an email yet telling people to, you know, s- or uh, buy tickets to my shows? Have I posted enough to my social media? Do I need to clip out a piece of my stand up? So a lot of like that kind of stuff. And then usually in the afternoons, we're either recording other podcasts or um, meeting with people talking about comedy, whether it's people coming to the studio to help us figure out like what to do with the sound or just getting stuff together, like putting up all these frames in here or getting like stuff on the walls for the studio. And then um, for me, I try my best to have like a little bit of time to myself before I go to a show, whether it's even just on the drive there, like, or just going home and like being able to like change, get my shit together and just go to the show um, and be able to write out a set list if I know how much time I'm doing. Um, And then, yeah, the, you know, the fun part is going to the show, getting your set list, meeting the comics that you're going to be performing with, performing, saying hi to audience people afterwards, whether it's selling a sticker or just saying hi, taking a photo, and then kind of like going home and watching TikTok until I fall asleep. <laughs> so what? let's talk about that because I think self-care and um, and free time, especially for entertainers and you know, the gig economy is really important and crucial when yeah. we have time for that. So outside of because we all fall down that uh, that TikTok rabbit hole and mm. it's it is deep. Um, what do you like to do? We live in Colorado. You know it's beautiful outside. Do you like to go hiking? Do you? <laughs> no, <laughs> I hate hiking with my every fiber of my being. I'm the worst Colorado resident. I am because I grew up here. Like I grew up in Boulder, and like I think I was forced to hike as a kid. So now I'm like no. You know what I mean. <laughs> I like to go on a walk. Like I would love okay. to go on. Like I love going on a walk around like a lake where there's nature, but up a hill to me is just like too much. You know what I mean? I, honestly, it's been fifty fifty for those who live here that I've talked to. Whether yeah. it's yeah, I love a fourteen or at four in the morning, or fuck that, nah, I'm just gonna right. go for a walk. We'll get brunch and then yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, we'll kind of veg. Um, out. I mean, I like to. I feel like I, I I'm not as good with giving myself time to myself as I wish I was like I try to at least every weekend have like one day where I don't do anything and it's really hard to do that because for me I feel like if I'm not being productive it makes me feel like I'm a bad comedian or a bad like creative person or whatever um but yeah I try to have at least like my Sunday or Saturday be a day if I'm not doing a show like to just hang out like clean my my space like read a book like just try my best to do something um but yeah it's really hard like I'm not I I also have a hard time like I need to force myself to sit down and write a lot because I used to be the type of comic that like wrote every day when I was first starting out and I was writing like terrible jokes but I was writing you know what I mean like I was just getting through all the shit and now it's like when I write, I kind of have to force myself to like sit down, give myself an hour, really think through something before like going and trying it out. So it's definitely changed. Let's talk about your process. Cause I find that I'd like to nerd out with anyone who's writing anything, you know, screenplays, comedy, whatever. What's your process like now as far as preparing as opposed to when you were writing mm. every single day? Are you doing audio memos on your phone, testing like what what's your mm comedic process like um when I first started I would do like I would try my hardest to write um one-liners and like like set up punchline jokes uh which is kind of for some people like when I when I took a class that was what I was taught was that your joke has to have a setup and a punchline um but now comedy has shifted and and it was when i took the class but i think that teacher was just a little more old school but comedy has shifted to like a storytelling platform for so many people so a lot of comics are really good at like just kind of talking and their punchlines are laid throughout like a story but they're not doing like a setup punchline type of joke where it's like one sentence here's the setup and then one sentence here's the punchline Um, So I used to write a lot like that. And then I think I've tried really hard to break away from that. So now, like, especially because I'm writing more about my personal experiences and my life rather than like 
a subject, if that makes sense. Like I'm trying to write about what has actually happened to me rather than something that I just have an opinion about. Um, I'll like have an idea and I'll talk about it out loud to myself because what I've found is like when you write, I always feel like writing is like a really final form. It's like you're putting the word to the paper. So that's how you have to say it. Whereas now, like if I have an idea, like, uh, like I had, I have an idea about like, um, what it's like to be curvy in the summertime. Right. And like all the bullshit you have to deal with when you have thick thighs in the summertime or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I'll like just stand up to myself in my apartment and I'll just start talking about it as if I'm talking to an audience and be like and think about like, okay, if there was someone if there's a woman sitting there right now and she's hearing me say this, what would she relate with me saying? So I talk about like under boob sweat or like how your thighs rub together or whatever it is. And then I kind of write it down. And then as I say it more and more out loud, it kind of like it kind of like gets shorter and less. uh less vague it becomes more specific and it's really weird because I've only recently started doing that but it helps because I feel like when I just try to write a joke on paper it's always terrible the first time and then when I say it out loud it doesn't actually sound the way that I would normally say it so I've started to like learn to just say it out loud a few times and then write it down and then kind of redo that that was a very long-winded way of saying I no, just talk no. to myself. It, it's you know it's your process yeah it, it's um that's really interesting that you are in a way. And I think a lot of, cause I have a lot of actor friends who listen to this. There are so many similarities to what you just said and what we do when we're. Oh yeah. For a scene. Yeah. Um, and it, I found that really interesting that you are imagining somebody in the, the crowd or you're, you're mm -hmm. looking at it from a, <laughs> maybe really weird to say, but like a beautiful mind perspective where you are putting, yeah. you know, all of that landscape in front of you, even though you're in your, your home. Mm -hmm. So, Let's talk about, uh, you know, awkward experiences in comedy. Yeah. It's like hecklers oh, I have so and many. getting on stage. I've, I could go on. Do you have a three-hour episode today? Hey, I you on. know what? I'd, we have plenty of time for that. Or, you know, we have you back. Because I feel like any comic has, whether they're a yeah. year in or three years in, um, what's... Uh, What's your most awkward experience on stage? Because I got to hear that. Most awkward or yeah. most terrifying or most like bomb? Well, like. Well, I will preface this by saying I do have uh, a party story question for you in this episode. And that's oh, something we'll get okay. to later. But um, that experience will be something that stands out so immensely you would easily tell it to friends at a party because it's just like, oh, my God, this oh, is insane. Oh, okay. Then I have one for that. Yes, you, <laughs> okay. can, you can save that story for I have, that. Okay. Some awkward experiences. Um I used to, I had a friend who played music at a uh, lounge on Sunday nights at a, it was called Trade Winds Tropical Lounge. Oh. And it was down on the bay in St. Augustine. This old guy played guitar and uh, he, and he liked me and I had done his open mic at his uh, Irish bar a few times. And he's like, Hey, I play three hours. They gave me, they give me a 20 minute break after the first hour and a half. Why don't you go do stand up? And to me, I treated it as like an open mic. Right. And yeah. so like, no one knew who I was. Obviously, I was just this random girl just kind of coming on stage like after someone that they had locally known as like, oh, Joe, he plays guitar every Sunday. We love him, whatever. And so I had all these jokes that I was running through and I don't do any of these jokes at all anymore. They're all just like kind of, you know, that first that first year of comedy, just like cranking out stuff that's kind of random. And yeah. uh, I started to do jokes about how my mom was a firefighter and she really was a firefighter. And, uh, I joked about how like awkward it must've been for her as like a woman. And like, I probably made it a little more sexual than it needed to be. But again, I was like at this point, maybe six months into comedy. So really just like, like the iceberg of just the tip of like all the shit you could talk about. So I'm like, Oh, my mom is a sexual object. Clearly that's something that I need to talk about. <laughs> and this woman stood up in the middle of, the joke and she had been kind of heckling me, but she was drunk. So I ignored it, but she stood up in the middle of a joke and says, that was, that was awful. And I was like, Oh, you think that was awful? Cause I'm such a smart ass. I was and I, I like, I just, I'm such an asshole. I was like, Oh, you thought that was, and she goes, she goes, yeah, I think you should get the fuck off the stage. And I didn't know what to do at that point because no one had ever said that to me before. Like, I thought that I could just kind of joke around and play it off, but she was actually very visibly upset. 
And uh, I looked at the my friend Joe, who had been playing guitar. He was kind of off drinking a beer on the side of the stage. And he was like, maybe just wrap it up. Like, maybe you're good. And this, and this lady was still kind of, like, yelling at me. But other people around her were telling her to shut up and coming to my defense. So that was at least good. But it was weird because it was, like, this really, like, conservative bar so all of the people that were defending me were like wearing maga hats and being very, like it was like <laughs> i was like i don't know if i want these people on my side but i appreciate it you know what i mean so i got off stage and then uh everyone everyone was like kind of fine but i i distinctly remember sitting in the back and watching joe get his stuff getting ready to start the next half of his like music set and this lady was still talking shit about me to whoever she was sitting with. And she was an older woman. So she clearly like, you know, to me, I'm like, like this young, somewhat comedian, not even a comedian yet, but just trying to do comedy and talking about my mom and people around her were like, Hey, can you just shut up? Like, we get it. Like you didn't let, like just leave. And then eventually like I said something to her and I was like, I can hear you talking shit about me right now. Like, can you please stop? Because I was just sitting there, like, trying to just, like, enjoy the fact yeah. that, like, I got to even do stand-up that night. And then I think she ended up leaving. But it was so awkward because it was, like, th that always sucks when, like, someone does something and the whole bar is against her. But then she just wants to stay and, like, ruin it for everybody else. But to her defense, my jokes were pretty fucking awful. So <laughs> I don't really blame her at the same time. Uh, it seems like you were bathing in fire that night, as far as mm -hmm. you know. Hey, this is if this is the worst it gets, cool. Like at least you know you can yeah. handle it. But she sounds like she had some real Ursula energy to her. Well, it's funny because like now and in Florida, I was always heckled by old people. It was always the older people who always had a problem. And I think my other favorite time was I was at a club that I featured at regularly, and uh, they had me there every few months, and I I did really well there. Uh, but that particular set, like it wasn't a great set. It was just kind of like an early Friday night show. Uh, not a lot of people there. Um, and so my jokes weren't going super well. And this guy who was sitting maybe three rows back, like I could hear him. He said to his wife, he goes, uh, he goes something like 5,000 unemployed comedians in this area. And I got to listen to her tonight. And I couldn't, I couldn't like keep it in. I was like, oh, do you have something you'd like to share with the class, sir? And he goes, no, 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 I'm good. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, since you don't want to share it, I'll tell the rest of the crowd. Because by this point, I was like 20 minutes into a 30-minute set. It was not growing great. And I was like, you know what? Fuck it. Like, what else am I going to do at this point? And uh, I repeated what he said. I go, this guy said, you know, 5,000 unemployed comedians, I got to listen to her tonight. And everyone started booing him. <laughs> and I was like, and I was like, no, 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 wait a minute. I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable because this guy was obviously upset that I was calling him on his bullshit. And his wife was like very embarrassed. And I said to him, I'm like, no, I'm glad that you said that because I'm at a point in my career now where every time I get someone like you commenting on my comedy, that means I'm doing something. And he kind of like cowered back and of course it was like one of those moments like everyone starts clapping and they're like you go girl and I didn't really mean it to be that I just wanted to tell him like I don't care if you think I'm bad because I know that like this is just the beginning of a career for me but yeah that was pretty funny and then when he left the show like we were all kind of filing out he looked at me and he's like you know I, I really didn't mean it like that and I was like well you certainly said it like that and then he just walked away <laughs> but it's I was just like okay Cool. <laughs> you know, it was going to eat him away for the rest of his life if he didn't say that last thing before they left that night. Yeah, I think in moments like that, it's always those types of people who they want to say something until they realize that you're an actual human and you can have the you have the ability to respond back. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of people think comedians are invincible. They think that because we're a comedian that we don't have feelings or that we don't that we think everything is a joke. Like, I've had people say things to me, and then when I, like, tell them to fuck off, they're like, wow, you're, like, pretty sensitive for a comic. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm a, hu I'm a human being who does comedy. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not this, like, stainless steel clown on stage that you can just, like, abuse. You know what I mean? But, yeah, those are, like, probably the two 
most oh awkward God. stories. Well, and there's something to say about artists and creators in general being more sensitive, you know, mm-hmm. to emotions or experiences, and that's where the art comes from. You know, it's just for that sure. There, there's a reason why, you know, uh, especially comics, like why you're so good at what you do is because you're observing everything and absorbing everything and hearing everything. And uh, I don't know when it comes to to bad nights like that. You know, when they were happening, or you know, occasionally they they're going to happen in someone's career. Mm-hmm. You know, do you have a, a decompression uh, sort of modality or process to just kind of flush that night away? No, I wish okay. I did. It usually just takes time. Yeah, like that type of interaction doesn't bother me as much as just like a true like bomb. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Because if I'm not doing well and I know I'm not doing well, but I know that I'm at a club and I'm getting paid and I'm just like doing what I have to do. That's like one thing. I think a lot of comics like we experience that everyone has bad sets. Everyone has bad like weekends. And sometimes it's the crowd. Sometimes like something happened in the atmosphere that you don't know. You know what I mean? Like comedy is kind of delicate like that. But I feel worse when I'm on a show that gives me every opportunity to do well. And I just fuck it up. (laughs) Like that makes me feel worse. You know what I mean? Yeah. Because in that instance, it's like, if I'm on a show where other comics are getting laughs and they're doing well and they're getting the crowd to keep up with them, but for some reason that night I can't, that's when I'm like, fuck. And I kind of, I kind of go into my shell. Like when I come off stage, I'll probably like just go into the green room and like be in my shell because I just feel embarrassed. And for me, it's like, I'm at a point still where even though I know everyone bombs and I know that everyone has had bad nights, I still get really embarrassed when I do that in front of comics that I really admire because I'm like, oh, fuck, they probably think I suck now, which isn't true. They're probably just like, yeah, that was like a bad show or that was a bad set. Like we've all bombed and we've all done it. So I have to remember that it's not as big of a deal as I think it is. Yeah, that's that's a really good point. And I'm really curious if you have, uh, you know, if you do have any uh, comic influences that have mm. helped shape your approach to your career. Maybe not yeah. somebody you idolize, but is there anyone that you you still listen to for? You know what? Um, I d- I don't really listen to comedy anymore because it feels like work, which is really sad. Ah, okay. like I like I have a hard time. Like when I'm watching a special, I feel like I should be taking notes. And so it's really hard for me to just, like, enjoy watching a special. Um, I definitely, like, I definitely, the first person that I ever idolized in comedy was Taylor Tomlinson. Because I saw her special right when it came out when the pandemic hit. And, like, that was, like, kind of when she blew up. Um, But I I had no idea who she was. And I just, like, loved her style of comedy and I get compared to her a lot, which is interesting because I don't I don't I don't want to be compared to anybody because I don't want to ever feel like I'm ripping off someone else's persona on stage. I think people when they see like a young female comic who just kind of tells it like it is, they're like, oh, you're like this person or you're like this. people also are like, oh, you're like Tina Fey. And I'm like, in what fucking way? <laughs> I think people just like to for, for them. It helps them understand who you are to compare you to someone they already know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she was kind of the first person that I ever like idolized, but now like, I don't even, I don't even like, I, like I watched her second special, but like when I see comedy pop up on like my for you page or my Instagram, I immediately like keep scrolling, not because I don't like it, but just because it feels like, I'm just like, Oh, here we go. Like another, I sit through so much comedy every week that online I'm like, all right, I'd rather just look at a dog. You know what I mean? (laughs) Well, what's what's a I don't know an entertainment medium that that you do enjoy? If you're not watching comedy, are you? Mm. Can you uh, when you have time watching movies, watching TV shows? I listen to a lot of um, podcasts. Okay. Like I like to listen to um, the Bald and the Beautiful with Trixie and Katya, the two drag queens from oh, RuPaul's oh Drag God. Race. That sounds um, awesome. And then I also listen to drew afwalo who is a huge tiktok like star she has a really good podcast where she brings on guests and they kind of talk about like their journey and in whatever like marginalized group they may be a part of and like their experience online and the whole thing is they go through like comment sections so they kind of talk about like people who leave mean comments and i listen to a lot of a lot of podcasts yeah i don't have as much time to like 
watch TV anymore. Um, but when I do, it's usually like a stupid crime documentary or like a, <laughs> I don't know, Black Mirror or something. Oh my god! Well, I was yeah. I was gonna pull a, a joke out and see if you know if you can't watch comedy if something like Schindler's List helps you relax. Um, yeah, dude, it's sure. like always. <laughs> I don't know, but I also love like I watched like Spirited Away the other night. I don't know. Oh, I'm like wow. in an I'm like in a weird, but yeah, podcasts yeah. are the, the way to go. But you're, I mean, yeah, you're you're busy, so there's you know, yeah, uh, and I mean, this is something to just kind of ask anybody who listens to a lot of podcasts because I do as well. Do you find it weird where you find yourself uh, listening to music and it just I don't know, it just seems so weird after listening to people talk for yeah. 12 hours. I, I find <laughs> myself getting in a better mood when I listen to music. I think because, like, I forget that music has such a, like, I don't even know what the word is, but it has such a unique effect on us. Like, because when you like a song and you're jamming out, it's such a different feeling than, like, listening to someone talk who you think is funny. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, I like to listen to music if I can. Good. I feel yeah. vindicated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I had, it sounds weird, but I had Dashboard Confessional come on my radio when I was driving over here, and I was just elated immediately. Mm, yeah. Oh, okay. I need to switch it up a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, as we're uh, we're getting to the, you know, the latter end of this episode, let's get into your party story. It seemed like you had... Yeah, a, well, a it's not a setup. fun story, but I th I think it's hilarious now that it has already happened. Oh, God. But when it happened, it was not fun. Oh, God. Okay, okay. So I just think this is like, this is like my like villain origin story. So <laughs> I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you every dirty detail. Do it. So last year I was living in Orlando, Florida. I'd lived there for a few months after I lived in Jacksonville. So I moved to Orlando and uh, I got an email from uh, like a brand saying, hey, we've heard that you're a female comedian. Uh, we're looking for a comedian to do this show. You were recommended by the improv, which is the Orlando improv is kind of like the main club there. Um, and I had no idea what it was. So I looked it up and it was called um, like Supergirl pro or something like that. Mm -hmm. And it was an all female surf competition in Jacksonville that also had like, it was kind of like a festival where they had like a surf competition during the day. And then at night they had like, food and music and like an all-female dj contest and like an all-female band thing and blah, blah blah so it was really cool it was like this female positive fun event family event in jacksonville which i was already familiar with and they were like hey we want to pay you to do a set like uh opening or one of the nights like when we have a band and immediately I was like, okay, comedy and music don't really like mix together if a if a comic opens for a band and the comic is the first person you see on stage it could go well but if a comic is going on stage directly after a band and then a band is coming up after them it can be really hard for the audience to like switch into the mode of comedy after they had been jamming out for to a band so anyway I, I asked a bunch of questions I like tried to just make it like I tried to get as much info as possible because I was worried it wasn't going to go well um but anyway, I signed a contract. They put me on their website. It was like a whole thing. They were like, you're going to be opening for Smash Mouth. I was like, sick. I love Smash Mouth. My dad made a mixtape of Smash Mouth for me when I drove his Subaru out back to school. And I was like, this is fucking <laughs> sick. And my dreams have never been crushed faster because I got to this place and there were they said 5,000 people. To me, that seems like a lot, but there were a lot of people. They said 5,000 people at this amphitheater slash market area right on Jacksonville Beach, right? So the beach is right on the other side. There's this amphitheater, this big hotel parking lot. It's exactly what you think of as like outdoor music festival, right? So there's a reggae band on. I go back to get my media pass. You go through this whole hoopla. It is really cool to be backstage at an event like that. But um, I get in there and the guy's like, OK, so he had the, I signed the contract saying that I was going to do 20 minutes. So I was getting paid to do 20 minutes. And then he says, hey, just so you know, I think we're going to we're going to have you do like 10 to 15 minutes instead, just because you're going to go on during the, the sound check. And I was like, I was like, what? And he goes, yeah, so that band's going to come off. You're going to have 10 to 15 minutes while we get Smash Mouth set up. And you're going to do comedy. 
And I was like, I was like, so you're going to be checking the instruments while I'm on stage. And the guy could not give less of a fuck. I mean, he was like, to me, I could have been like one of those guys that has a chihuahua that climbs up their feet at a basketball game. You know what I mean? They were like, <laughs> who is this weirdo? I don't care. And so they say, okay, you're going to go to the front of the stage. You can only walk in this little area because everything else was surrounded by instruments, amps, blah, blah, blah. They give me a wireless mic and uh, I'm on stage and like, you know how at a music festival, like the time in between bands is usually a time when people are like, talking they're like getting another drink they're like smoking weed like they're talking to their friends like they don't care about anything until the band they're there to see is on stage and smash Mouth was obviously like headlining that night like it had it was already 9 p.m like this was clearly the main act right so they tell me to go on stage and immediately there's like 12 guys behind me like you know fixing the tuning the guitar playing the drums like so fucking loud and so they basically just go here's the comedy stylings of morgan gallo and i walk out there and i just kind of like tried to riff on the whole situation like i tried to be like hey guys <laughs> like <laughs> who's doing drugs tonight like it was so bad it was so and immediately people were like not into it like oh, no. and I hate to say this, but for an all female event, there were a lot of angry dudes at this like event. And I mean, like it was not a female positive at that particular juncture. I'm sure during the day, all female surf contest, all female DJs go Queens. Yas. But like that night, that was not the energy. Like, so I'm doing my set and I'm trying to riff on like, Oh, like, you know, like, cause one guy started yelling at me saying, you're not funny. And so I tried to riff and be like, oh, like this guy doesn't think I'm funny, but he definitely subscribes to my OnlyFans. <laughs> and like some people were laughing and some people were paying attention, but the majority of people were not. So anyway, I start getting booed. I start getting yelled at. Um, and I keep looking at my phone because I was timing myself. And I was like five minutes in and I had blown through a bunch of material. And so... I think it got to maybe like nine minutes and I was like, I'm getting the fuck off this stage. I don't even care about the money anymore. I don't care. So I just said, thanks. I'm Morgan Gallo. Bye. And so I get off stage and no one is there to like handle me. Like no one is there to tell me where to go, what to do. And I'm just standing there and I'm, I have so much of this awful adrenaline going because like I just, when I said my name is Morgan Gallo and I got off stage, I got booed by like 5,000 people or however many people were out there. So it was not a good experience. Like I was, it was clearly not a situation that I should have been in. So I get off stage and I don't know what to do. I'm like, where do I go? Like, I just want to get the fuck out of here. So I just give my mic to a random girl and I was like, can you please take this before I cry? And so I got off stage and I went into a utility closet and I started crying and I've never cried like that before in my life. Cause it was like, like heaving like like you know when you feel like you can't control your body that's how it was yeah, yeah those deep cries and i was sitting there and the girl who had like kind of gotten me into the dressing room before like the girl who basically like showed me where I, what i was doing like she had already had a rapport with me she came in and without saying anything just started hugging me so it was clear that like everyone else knew what i had just experienced you know what i mean it wasn't like i was just throwing a fit everyone else clearly saw what just happened so she's trying to like comfort me and I'm like, I got mad. And I was like, why the fuck did you make me do that? I was like, why did you guys think that it was a good idea for me to go out and do 10 minutes of comedy when you're not even respecting me as a performer and you're banging a bunch of instruments? You know that all of these people are drunk. It's like, I was like so upset. And she was like, well, we didn't know that you were going to be so dirty. And that's when I got mad because when they reached out to me, I had said to them several times hey just so you know i'm not a clean comedian please let me know if there's any material you see online that you don't want me to do and they and they had by that time like all of my comedy is always online you can look up videos like i i post a lot of shit and so i was thinking okay they've done their research like i signed the contract you know what i mean yeah. and then she's like she's like yeah we just didn't expect you to like you know, curse so much. And I just, I was like so confused. And so I'm like crying, I'm crying. She leaves me be. Now people are coming in and out of the utility closet to like get, you know, snacks for the performers or 
lighting or whatever was in there. And eventually I just like when it had kind of died down and now Smash Mouth is playing. <laughs> I'm listening to like All Star and I'm like, I'm going to go walk into traffic. So I get my shit. My camera is still on stage because so, for some reason I thought I should film this and I probably still have the video and I haven't looked at it. And then I, I got all my shit and I just like I beelined it to my car so fast. And the worst part is one of my like like comedy friends was there like who had grown up with me in the mic scene and like he had seen me do comedy for the last two years. Like he was there and he just like hugged me and was like, dude, at least you got paid. Like he just, and then he walked me to my car, make sure I got home safe. And I was just like, I literally, I just got on the phone with my boyfriend as soon as I got in the car and I drove two hours home to Orlando and I cried. It was so bad. But the f the the <laughs> reason that that's my party story, I know it's very sad, is because in what world do you think, in what world has any uh, comedian ever been like, yeah, I opened for Smash Mouth and their entire <laughs> crowd booed me. Like, it's so funny now because looking back, like, I should have never taken that gig. But at that time, I was still working like a job. They were paying very handsomely. I was like you know what, like, I'm not full-time comedy yet. Like, I'm going to take this money. And, like, I genuinely love Smash Mouth. I know that's a very unpopular opinion for a young liberal white woman to have, but <laughs> come on. Like, you know what I mean? Like, their music just gets me, man. And so there, I just, I'll, I'll never forget the feeling of walking away crying and All Star is playing live behind me. I'm like, this is the worst. <laughs> And now I just think it's so stupid and funny. I can only see that as you're saying that as a cinematic moment. Right? Or like a really sad post credit scene of you driving and All Star starts playing on the radio. Like yeah. it's just it's gonna follow you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and it but. follows me everywhere. <laughs> like I think I think after that, I went to like Publix, which is like the King Supers here at grocery store. I went to Publix the next day and they were playing Smash Mouth. Like, in public. Like, I couldn't escape it for a while. Like, it was everywhere. I don't know how. Or, like, I would scroll TikTok, and I'd see a Shrek meme. that, ha And I was like, this is bad, dude. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I, it took me a while to get over that. But now I think it's just hilarious. It's a great story. It really Thank is. You. And I think that's one, you know, you get on a late show. You're not performing because you just reached that that upper echelon of comedy but now you're just you're talking about your special on a late show and that's the story you share yeah like, yeah immediately especially the the fact that like i was two and a half years into comedy at that point like and it was i, I just think the funniest part is that it was like an all-female positive celebrated event you know what i mean like and they, it was literally called super girl pro like everything was female owned all the food trucks there were female owned all the like you know what i mean and they they pushed it as this like positive experience and i was telling i had men like telling me to take my shirt off on stage you know what i mean and they were like booing me and like they were like it, it's just so ironic to me they're like you know what we're gonna have an all-female music festival but we're gonna have fucking smash mouth headline because clearly <laughs> They are the beacons of modern day feminism. Like that, that to me is just wild. That's insane. And it, you know, then it's Florida. So you get a whole nother piece of the yeah, there. Yeah. 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 God, man. That just hearing that story gave me, it gave me anxiety sweats like mm. inside. Just thinking mm -hmm. about that. Uh, this is a great transition though from that. And that's any advice you've personally held on to, mm. you know, throughout your career that you could, give to our listeners whether it's somebody who maybe wants to get into comedy yeah. or somebody who just wants to make a life change like you did oh yeah um i mean the thing that has always like helped me at least with comedy is i don't know where i got this from but i think it, i don't know if it was someone or if it was a book or something but it was just talking about like write what you know hmm. don't write what you think you know um meaning like you know, so many of us, like, we want to talk about so much on stage, especially with, like, what's going on in the world or something personal that happened in our life. Um, and I think for me, I've always stuck to, like, write what you truly know about because then you have more, like, space to play with it. Mm. Um, like, I, I could never, like, try to write about, like, you know, a sports team or like make jokes about the NFL. Like I could just cause I don't know about it and it's not going to be as fun telling it on stage 
because it's not what I know. Whereas when I talk about like my body or like being curvy or like things that are actually very relevant to my di- my life now, mm-hmm. it's a lot easier to joke about and it's a lot easier to write about because it's on my mind a lot more. Um, and then I think honestly, like in terms of switching, making the transition from like the nine to five to the full time comedy thing is like for me um, when I started comedy. I don't know why, but I immediately knew that it was the thing that I wanted to do with my life. And it actually was very, like, as corny as it sounds, kind of like a spiritual experience the first time getting on stage because I was like, oh, okay. I was like, this is what I'm supposed to do. Because I really was convinced that I was going to, like, be a marketer and climb the corporate ladder and become a VIP or a, not a VIP, a VIP. fucking, uh, <laughs> what's it called? Like a CMO of like a, sh- like I really thought I was going to do that. Um, so when I realized that comedy was the thing I wanted to do, I made it the priority in my life. So like I didn't like go on dates. I didn't really hang out with my friends. Like not, not that I was blowing them off, but like I just really focused on comedy for a while And then when I had the ability to move jobs, like I actually got a remote job so I could do comedy. And then when I got my remote job, I was like, okay, now I'm remote. I can like kind of perform wherever. Um, Then I kind of moved, I moved to a new city and then I started a podcast. And then I like, I really just like, I slowly took these like little steps to kind of get where I wanted to go. And then once I that kind of happened and then I got laid off and then when I got laid off from that job literally everything snapped into place and within six months I was moved out here like opened this studio with my partner and like things have just like fallen into place now but it did take like two and a half years of like struggling through like okay I work eight to five and then I'm gonna go do a mic until 1 a.m. and then I'm gonna wake up the next day and I'm gonna request pto for a show so i can drive two hours just to go do five minutes like you know what i mean like it yeah. d- it did take a lot of sacrifice the first few years but um i think if you make it a priority in your life and if you are honest with yourself about like the time you have and the mental capacity you have to do it then it's all yours you know what i mean yeah no i i absolutely love that and uh, coming from somebody who you know, I stumbled upon your stuff on TikTok. I think it was a year, year and a half ago. Oh, cool! And I was just like, "She's fucking hilarious," you know. Oh, thank and it, you. it's just nice to to see you know, how much you've grown, even in that short amount of time. And I can mm-hmm. only imagine where it's going to go from here. And I'm super excited to see you know, what happens in your career. Thank you. Um, it's just I don't know. It's just it's really cool. That's the whole point of this this show is to hear someone's story, where mm-hmm. they came from, how they pivoted. And especially like where they want to go. So let's say five years from now, dude, where do you want to be? Oh, that's such a hard question. I mean, okay. So in five years from now, I will be 32 going on 33. And that means that I will have been doing comedy for like eight years. So I think, I mean, I think five years from now, I would love to be in a place where I'm like touring and headlining regularly, not like doing crazy shit. Like I'm not looking for like theaters or I would just love to be in a place where like I'm, I'm doing comedy clubs on the weekends and it's, I'm the headliner and like, I'm also producing podcasts um, with dude. I don't know. And our space has turned into, cause from five years from now, I mean, we may, may not even be in this space. We might be in like a bigger one or, um, maybe producing shows like for Denver and like a bigger theater or definitely having our podcast network kind of work for itself and, and be like a conglomerate of Denver comedy. And, um, yeah, I think I'll be here. I think I, I love Denver and I think Denver is such a, like, underrated comedy scene i mean a lot of people know about it but like the people who don't i'm like oh man denver is amazing because there's just so much talent here and what's refreshing to me is there's so much like hard working people here you know what i mean by that yeah. like oh, absolutely and then you probably run into this where like there's people who are like actors but then there are people who are like actors you know what i mean like they're put they're 
putting in the work. They're constantly like doing clips, learning monologues, sending in self tapes, like the people who are like doing the work every day. It's so nice to be around that. And it's really inspiring. Yeah, I, I totally agree about, I mean, this is eight years ago when I was in stand up comedy in Denver, but man, the, then was, it was so cool going to like mutiny cafe on um, mm, an open mic yeah. night and seeing the people who were headlining that weekend, just practicing their stuff in a room full of yeah comics. yeah that's you so know, cool it's just it's beautiful so that that's cool I, i'm looking forward to that and as we're, we're wrapping up with one more thing um before we sign off but i want to see if there's anything i can give a shout out to or promote yes. in this episode for you so as you know we are recording in dude idk studios and i just have to say that uh nick holmby the founder of dude i don't know has been an incredible person and creative in the Denver comedy scene. And I'm really lucky to be a part of his company. And I think that now, like as a team, we're expanding um, and getting more people involved and having more comics here. And like, I just have to give a shout out to him for being the one that actually was like, you know what, this is, we're going to do this. And this was also pandemic born. So it's kind of like very serendipitous that we both had careers that kind of kicked off with the pandemic. So maybe more people should get sick. I don't know. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> maybe more people need to get COVID and we'll have more inspiration. I feel like it's your new bumper sticker or at the very least. Yeah. A shirt, go get yeah. COVID so I can start a company. I don't know. <laughs> well, perfect. For, uh, before we, we sign off on this, I want to say this was a blast uh, yeah. you know, just talking to you after having been a fan for the last, you know, couple of years. Oh, thanks. And, That's so nice of you to say. I, I, dude, I was so excited for this. When he said, oh, yeah, I'd love to come on the podcast. I'm like, oh, shit. She said, yeah. yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it. I got it. No, it's it's <laughs> honestly, it's so cool for me because even the fact that you say the word fan is like so weird to me. So it's like oh, really, bet. it's really cool to be at a place where people are like, I'm a fan of you. And I'm like, oh, you're serious. Like, it's so cool. <laughs> it's really cool. So thank you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, okay. This this should be a lot of fun. Uh, I close every episode with what I like to call an awkward goodbye. Okay. It's usually really, uh, it really delivers in video form, but this is audio. So we're going to have to sell this a little bit. Okay. Uh, just, I usually give like a silent three, two, one countdown, but we don't have to do that for you. You're professional. You know what okay. you're doing. So, uh, yeah, in the next uh, couple seconds, just give us your best verbal awkward goodbye. Anything you could think of. Awkward goodbye. Awkward. All I, I'm thinking about is, like, me being on stage after a bomb and just looking out at the crowd and be like, go drink some water. Okay, bye.